Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone back to Call Camp. This week we're doing something we've never done before, uh, this month I should say, and, and because it's June, there's just so many events going on, there are trade shows going on right now. I mean, in fact, half of our team is at one big one in, in Las Vegas at this very moment. And, and what, we're, what we're hearing is that, you know, the audience, you out there in Call Camp land, you have been asking us for this topic for a while, event follow-up. What are the best practices for event follow-up? All of our companies spend an enormous amount of money on events. And, and unfortunately, we generate tons and tons of leads that don't close, which is just an unfortunate situation. So what we're going to be talking about today is how do we optimize that process? And I'm joined by my good friend, Alice Hyman. And she and I, when I first saw this, what you, what you put together, Alice, I thought it was genius, the concept of trade show makeover. And in, in fact, she actually spent a little bit of, of time with us at the Inside Sales Association, the AISP in Chicago, working on our table. And I'll be darned if, if, if we didn't get easily double the output just by virtue of the fact that you kind of coach us up on how to rearrange everything and how to, how to set it up all the right way. So Alice, uh, welcome to Call Camp. Well, thank you. And it's great to hear that the work we did with you at your booth was helpful. I think a lot of times we do trade shows so frequently that we forget some of the basic things like how to make our booth open and inviting. And so just a couple quick changes to your booth when you first set it up uh, to make sure that you look at it from all angles and that you make it so that as people walk by, they feel like they want to walk into your space uh, can make a huge difference. We call that that space inside your booth, the discovery zone, Steve, and that's where all the good stuff happens. And so I think it's just something we forget about sometimes because, you know, the show uh, organizers give us a six foot table and what do we do with it? We put it up in, in front of the booth, right? But that table ends up blocking the people we want to talk to from us. So it's just sometimes as simple as moving that table uh, aside and having a nice open fun space for people to walk into so um this is some of the fun things you can do to make higher quality conversations that of course then lead to better follow-up and, and that's what this webinar is all about we're going to do something a little different this time we are going to play calls on webinar follow-up event follow-up at the end in the beginning we're going to talk a bit about the lead up to the event how to actually execute the event and then what to do after the event um and i'll tell you what when when you watch people, and I've, I've been either an exhibitor at or I've been an attendee at like literally hundreds of events, and I've, I see this movie again and again where you have a participant walking by a table and they kind of look over to the right. I wish you could see my visual. And then they kind of mm -hmm. look ahead and they kind of look again. And there's just there, that's the opportunity for the people at the table to engage with the prospect. I mean, you're in a room full of the best fish in the world that you want to catch. And I see, unfortunately, so many people, they just let that fleeting moment pass. And that's where ROI is either made or lost on these big trade shows. So everyone tweet us at Call Camp. We're actively here. Sam, as always, is here doing, Sam, say hi, everybody. Hey, guys. We've also got Logan helping out on Alice's team. So if you have any questions, you can tweet us at execvision, at Alice Hyman, at show makeover we're all over the place let's make it happen today this is going to be great okay so um why are why do our event leads not close alice talk to us here <laughs> well you know this is what everybody wants right they want to go to a show get great leads and close deals uh but traditionally it's interesting uh steve a lot of companies have looked at trade shows as an as more of a marketing event than a sales event. And so with that, they spend a lot of money and do some things that maybe don't actually get us leads that can close. So an example of that is marketing sets up this beautiful booth and gets everything ready and, and some marketing people and some salespeople go and they have these scanners and they decide that they're gonna scan everybody that approaches the booth. That is not a strategy that gets you closed deals. Right. It is, however, a strategy that will build a big list. The problem is we don't know if anybody on that list is actually really interested in what we do. So if we think about 
you know, what we have to do before we even get to the show in order to turn those high quality leads into deals, we're gonna change our behavior before that show even starts. And, and Alice, I think it's the thing, it's like, you know, the, the classic marketing branding versus marketing demand generation thing. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll joke on our, our senior director of marketing, Angela, earlier this week, she handed me this really cool exec vision pen with you hit a button and, it, and the logo flashes and I sort of smiled, you know, wryly, although it's fun and it makes people smile, it, it's not gonna be the thing that's gonna fill our funnel with opportunities and, and that's the difference, I think, is like, if, if you want to fill your funnel with opportunities, that's what we're talking about at this, on this webinar, right? Fill your funnel, funnel with actual opportunities, not build a list of people who walked by your booth. Yeah. Really important, I need everybody to get that point, because what most companies are doing is building a list of people who walked by or stopped in their booth, and they're not actually qualifying those and, you know, really having conversations that let you know whether those can be a sales opportunity that will get into your pipeline or funnel. I use pipeline and funnel interchangeably just so everybody knows. So uh, I think this, this cartoon is hilarious, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for finding this. Uh, I think Sam found it, but um, you found yeah. It? Made it. Oh, oh, you made it. That's really good. Oh, oh you made it. Awesome. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so a prospect at the booth sounds interested. So what does that mean? Well, of course, I'm at the booth, I'm at the show, I'm happy, I'm interested, I'm walking around, I'm talking to people, right? But yeah, just because I'm talking to you doesn't mean I'm a qualified prospect, right? It doesn't mean anything really. Yeah, and hey, Alice, I, can I just tell a story on this one? Because I think it's yes, yes, yes. so pertinent here. Um, you know, I, you got to start with the ideal customer profile first and educating the people at the table. What is the ideal customer profile? Um, in the in the case of exec vision, we have very specific language. We call it second level leaders. So the people who manage managers at companies with 25 or more reps or agents that live and die by the phone. Now, if if there is a trade show and a rep from a company with 25 or more reps that lives and dies by the phone. If, if we're talking to them, that's, that's great because they can give us information to springboard to the second level leaders. So anyway, we educate all of our people prior to the event, never stand behind your table ever, never catch me behind the table. You've got to be in front of the table and you've got to be engaging people in conversations about their business. And the thing that, that, that happened, <laughs> I actually will call the guy out because he can take it. His name is Tyler. When we, we brought him to Chicago to that same inside sales event, and this guy is the most gung ho, you know, so excited to be out there, finally meeting people in person, all this kind of stuff. It's great. It's great. He's excited. He comes back to me, Steve, I just had the best conversation. This person's so interested. Da, 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 da. And I, I start asking, good, like, what's their business? Where are they from? Why are they so interested? And it turns out that it's, it's a, someone who does consulting. They do sales training consulting. And I go, hey, Tyler, that, that's wonderful. That person could potentially be a route to their clients, potentially. But you're in a room full of exactly the right types of fish. You know, if you're trying to catch tuna, you're literally in a room full of tuna. And you just found a flounder. And that's cool. Flounder are great, right? That's, that's, it's good to know them. But you've got to focus your, ear, your, your ears and pay attention to the business issues of the right people aligned with your ICP. And he kind of went, oh, okay, boss, got it, got it, got it. And then I said, go fish, literally. And he went out and like went to the coffee stand and bam, struck up conversation with someone that actually had 100 people on the phone. That ended up being a real opportunity in the phone. Amazing, great story. And this really illustrates the need to prepare in advance. And I think that's the biggest failure point we see when we talk with companies about their trade show activity and their trade show results because the activity doesn't match the results, right? So if you think about this failure point being long before the show, so as you said, what is the ideal customer profile? Do all of the people working the booth know what it is and know to ha how to ask the questions to find out if this person that works at this company would be an ideal customer? So that's, that has to happen long before you ever show up, right? And training them to do that, practicing that a little bit, there's many other things that have to be done before the show ever starts if you really want to get qualified leads that turn into opportunities.
and so many of these events have these mobile apps or there are ways to determine who's attending or you know a big big borrow and steal your way into a list of attendees from a a sponsor at the platinum level or something like that. There's a lot of things you can do to figure out who's going to be there. So, so Alex, do you have any tips pre-event on like what are the the things that you'll do like with one of your clients, for example, to to train them on how to do that effectively? Like what sort of things should they be asking? Those kinds of things. Right. So the, it starts with research. Once they've chosen the show, it starts with research. What can you learn about this show? Right. So, what? Go to their website. There's tons of information. Figure out who the speakers are. Figure out who the sponsors are. Start getting connected with all the other speakers and sponsors because they could be your customers or prospects and or they could be a referral source. So we want to get friendly with as many people as we can before we show up so that when we get there, like they just they're so excited to see us. Right. Because we've been having conversations with them in advance uh, on social media promoting their, their posts or maybe talking with them on the phone. So do the easiest thing first, right? So research, research the show, research the topics, the trends, so that you have good information to have conversations with. Then research the people who put the show on, research the speakers, research the sponsors, get all that information ready. Then get your own messaging ready based on the research that you've done and train everybody on who your ideal customer is and the questions for that ideal customer based on the trends and topics at this particular show. So all that training needs to go on in advance. And what's critical to be able to be able to close deals from the show is the advanced communication. So even if you can't necessarily talk to the people you want to meet at the show, you can find them on social media and interact with them there. But hopefully you can call and at least leave a voicemail so they've heard your voice, they, they hear the enthusiasm, they heard your company name, you've invited them to come by or invited them to schedule an appointment. You've done that by phone, by email, by LinkedIn. So they walk by and they recognize your booth. They recognize the name. It starts there because otherwise they're just walking down you know, these rows, it's just a sea of exhibitors, right? And they don't know you and they've never heard of you. So let's make it easy for them to find us and to know us. We got to be memorable and all of that's got to be done before we get there. Otherwise, the rest of this doesn't make any difference. And, and Alice, the best compliment I ever got for, for my SDRs or I, or I get for my SDRs, my sales development reps as we go is, is when someone stops by a table and goes, the only reason I'm standing in front of you right now is because your your guy or your whatever was so persistent with me, and and I, I I knew I had to, I just had to see what you were all about, right? And then and then it becomes a question when you're executing that on the trade show floor, you got to reverse that very quickly because rather than showing them, showing them, showing them, and they go, okay, great, we have no need, thank you, bye. Instead, you got to transition into a conversation about their business real fast. Why did they go to the show? I wrote this article called. Um, uh, three questions that every rep should ask at events. It's like, why are, why did they go? What's their, right. what's changing in their business or what are their biggest business challenges? Those sorts of things. Yeah, absolutely. So that's another thing that has to be done pre-show based on, again, your research, what are questions you can ask and always want to find out what brought them to the show. It's a great question. It gets the conversation flowing. Unfortunately, Working a booth is not like working the phones or making a sales call. It's a different kind of selling and it's a very conversational kind of selling. It's networking. So we're not trying to sell while we're there. So that means we have to have things to talk about. And the best way to have something to talk about with somebody is to ask a great, great question and get them to talk. Just like you said, Steve, is ask them what, you know, what brought you to the show? What interesting things have you seen so far? What else are you looking for? Because again, all of this sets you up to be in a position where the follow-up is easy and they want to talk to you. They remember you. And that's when you get to open opportunities for your pipeline. Yeah, and, so, and that, that ties to what happens after the event. I've had this slide up for a while. Do you have any horror stories of uh, companies that you've seen over the years that suffered from all these bad or no notes in CRM, no workflow, no campaign tracking? 
Oh my gosh, I have a great one. So uh, this was a, com a company that went to World of Concrete, which World of Concrete, right? I mean, literally the world's made of concrete. It's one of the largest trade shows. It's in Vegas and it's humongous, right? So this company is a really cool company and they have great, cool equipment, you know, nice people, all of that. Well, the year before we worked with them, they went to the show and they scanned badges. I mean, that was their goal. Who could scan the most badges? <laughs> so I, seriously, they scanned a ton of badges and then they put all of that into their CRM and then they started making the phone calls when they got back. Now, the same people who worked the show didn't make the calls, which is, was, which is common. There's ways, you know, to still make that work. But um, I am not kidding you when I say that every call, the same response. No, I don't remember you. I don't think I stopped by your booth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everyone, disaster. Yeah. Ever, you are not a grocery store checkout clerk, right? Like, and I, you know, I've seen this at Dreamforce where people like literally like run up panicked to try to scan my badge. I think that some companies, Alice, even incent that kind of activity and that kind of they, they do they do yeah and it's they incent it pure insanity because it does nothing to demonstrate any sort of care about our business at all or or, or genuine authentic curiosity about how you know why, why we're there what challenges we're dealing with in our business what we're trying to accomplish in our business i use words that of course you know very well fix accomplish or avoid right um and and then and then based on what we're trying to fix accomplish or avoid in our business um, how they could potentially help. It's just not happening and it ties right back to notes. So talk to us about notes. Yeah, right. So l before I talk about notes, let's talk about being human. Right? Yeah. <laughs> sure. So forget sometimes that we need to be very human and very customer focused. So when we're at a trade show, it's not about us, it's about them. So we ask great questions, we listen to the answers, and if we're talking for a while, sometimes I just say, do you mind if I take a few notes? This is really interesting. Do you mind if I take a few notes? Now, if you don't have a notepad there, maybe you have your phone. It's kind of rude sometimes to pull out your phone and take notes. So you kind of have to think about how you best want to do this. But if you are listening with intent and focus, once they leave, you'll still have that memory of what they said and you can go quickly jot it down. So keep a keyboard, you know, a, handy so you can type it into your iPad or your phone or or just a pad of paper but get you know their name and their address and whatever you need if you collected their card or you scanned their badge but write their name and the notes and the notes should be things that remind you of what made them smile what made them laugh what got what they were intense about or serious about so when you call them back you can say, I remember when we were talking about this and you, you chuckled and I'm guessing you chuckled because your team does that. Right. Yeah. Um, or, you know, so that's human. I mean, that like, I remember our conversation. I was able to say something other than I met you at the booth and I'd like to schedule an appointment with you. And, I, and so I'll give you, I'll give you two. This, these are, this is like my super secret playbook that I've never, ever told anybody. Um, I actually do take notes on my cell phone. When I meet someone at an event, especially if they don't have a card, I always try to do the give them a card first, give to get, so you capitalize on the law of reciprocity. But I'll say, do you mind if I take notes on my phone? And I've never, Alice, not once had someone say no. And what I yeah. do, I ask for their email. What I do for that is I don't use a notepad. It's too much trouble. I open an email, because that's right in front and center of my phone. Yeah. And I email myself and I email them. And I have shorthand for my note taking. And in our world for exec vision, we're constantly qualifying on two things, team and tech. And we always have those in caps. So I'll put team in caps and then how many SDRs, how many account executives, if they're not in that kind of model, how many you know different selling roles or support roles they might have, all that kind of stuff. And I do it and our team does it in the same exact consistent way every time. And then I ask for their cell phone number. So assuming that there is an authentic need and there is a desire to continue, I'll say, great, my, my cell phone's at the bottom of this email, my signature, what's your cell phone number? And it's a simple qualification tool because if they give it to you, they actually care and they're going to push. And if they don't, they don't. 
And it's a simple thing that everybody can be doing, but just, I watch on the floor people, A, they don't listen, and B, if they are active, actually listening, they don't take any notes. It's absolutely insane. And then another thing that's insane that people are not doing is they do things like create duplicates in the database. When you see, uh, oh, right? Drive me nuts, yeah. drive me nuts. I had one. I mean, let's make a mess for our marketing team to clean well, up. I mean, seriously. Sales team, like today I had a salesperson come up to me and say, how well do you know such and such person. And I said, a little bit, not a lot, but I said his cell phone number is in Salesforce. So I typed the name of the person in the Salesforce and boom, my sales guy had created a duplicate. And the other one, the, the, the original, of course, had the cell phone number right there. I'm like, why don't you go look at this, right? Merge that duplicate out and then figure it out. So you have to, have to, have to update what you're doing. No duplicates. You've got to update that CRM and you've got to get answers to those questions that Alice and I have been talking about in the moment. I mean, update your update your CRM on your flight home. Update it after the, the hall closes. Oh, yeah. Quiet times. Do not sit there on your computer when you're in the middle of a break making your notes before the next person comes right. up. Break time's the busy time. Right. So this is the key to what I said earlier, is that, uh, that before, before the event planning, Make sure each sales rep has time scheduled in, not just to work the booth, but to work the leads. So they've got to walk away from the booth and have a quiet place. So let's say, you know, John worked all morning. Give John a break and let him go regroup on all the people he met, make his notes, put them in the database. And someone else worked the booth for a little while, right? So that it doesn't get to be two whole days and now John can't remember. And, and you know, we avoid this problem. So we have good notes, we don't have duplicates, um, and we have a memory of the questions that they answered so we can put them in to use them for a follow-up call, especially Steve, if, if I'm the one at the booth and let's say I'm in marketing, I'm not gonna be making those follow-up calls. I need really good notes so that the salespeople can make those follow-up calls. Oh, you met Alice at, at the conference. She was so excited to talk with you about. Um, I'd love to continue the conversation. Let's get scheduled. Again, being human and customer focused. But if I don't have those notes, it's just a cold call basically. Once more, we're back to the cold call. And not that cold 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 calls don't work, but they're harder. So I always want to make selling easier. And if I'm a human and I act like I'm calling a human and I'm focused on them instead of me, like I know I've got to close deals. I get it. I've got all this pressure on me. But if I let go of that and focus on this human being who has a need I can help, then things are so much better. Yeah. A amen to that. And, and, and a lot of that is going to come down to this sales and marketing alignment to avoid the checkout clerk. So talk about better workflow here. Yeah. So workflow is really important. And again, you can't do workflow while you're at the booth. That's too late. The workflow has to be figured out way before the show. So what is the workflow? What tools are we going to use? which leads go to marketing, which leads go to sales, all of that has to be figured out ahead of time, including the messaging. And if you've done your research well, the messaging is really easy because the one to many messaging that marketing sends out will be about the trends and the speakers and the topics and the cool things that happened at the show. And the one to one communication from salesperson to prospect will be about the specific conversations that were had. So that flow has to be worked out in advance. And especially when we have others working the booth, because I highly recommend we get customer success people there, marketing people there, senior executives, uh, senior salespeople, new salespeople. We want a variety. We want some subject matter experts. Maybe you have some engineers that should go. We want a wide variety of people at the booth and we want the right amount of people. Most times we're sending too few. We're sending too few people and it makes it really, really hard. But with all those people involved then, they may be having conversations with people that they won't follow up with. So if that workflow isn't determined 
prior to that show, it's going to be a mess. Now, there's tons of tools out there, and I'm probably not supposed to do that, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug a tool that I just think is phenomenal for trade shows. Um, a, a company called Modus. And full disclosure, they are my client, but they have a capture tool for trade shows that makes all of this workflow seamless. And like you were saying, Steve, when you open up that email and start typing that stuff in, this is all already included. Any attachment that the uh, prospect wanted can be attached to that email. Um, all the information is kept in one place. It, the workflow is all in there. You can tell whether the person opened the email or not. Find a tool like Modus Capture. There's lots of great things out there to help make your workflows easier because those badge scanners are so like 1980s. All they do is scan the badge and give you an Excel spreadsheet. That makes tons of work for everybody and it makes your workflow hard. Yeah. But if as you're capturing the leads, they're going to the right place at that moment that they're supposed to with the notes in them and everything, then everybody's job is easier. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and, you're, and you're hearing this, this one again and again here is, uh, is the, is it better to badge scan or is it better to get business? <laughs> I'll give you, I'll tell you what, I, I was watching this one guy who was gaining badges of women and like getting in their personal space, you know, cause the badge sits on their chest and it's just incredibly awkward, but he had no conscious, you know, no, no cognizance of this happening. <clears throat> and you could literally just see these people being revolted by this kid, you know, almost touching them to grab their badge. <laughs> you know, it's like, you've got people, come on, let's take it. Seriously, a seriously. And at Dreamforce, you know, okay, fine. It's, Bad enough and little side trip. Could someone please invent a better way to do a badge than have it hanging at my boobs or my belly button? I mean, I'm sorry. How dumb is that? You, No one can see it. You know, we really need the badges to be up on our shoulders. I know these lanyards because they got, you know, people's logos on them and all that, but we need a better way. So that's terrible that he's doing that. First of all, he doesn't even realize he's, you know, in their space. But at Dreamforce, I've literally had people grab my badge and pull it toward them to <laughs> scan it, almost choking me. And I'm not kidding. Um, so th this is just bad business. Um, I almost want to ban badge scanning altogether. And you know, the thing about it is, Steve, you and I both know people don't put the correct information in their badge because they know that people are going to scan it. That's right. That's right. And that's I mean, my answer for this question is neither, um, because you already heard my answer, which is pull out your phone and, you know, send an email to them and yourself and, and actually listen while they talk and take notes. All right, everyone, tweet us at Call Camp. Uh, if I'm curious, and I'll ask uh, the Call Campers listening on this one, what is your favorite question to ask when either at the event or after the event? What's your favorite question to ask? And I'll tell you one thing we haven't talked about is prearrange appointments. Pre, if you pre-arrange appointments, you almost guarantee that you're going to get ROI on that event. And it's a lesson I learned from Ken Krogh of InsideSales.com, my old mentor. Um, he taught uh, he taught me that if you pre-arrange appointments for the subject matter expert or the CEO, your probability of getting those appointments is much much higher because everybody wants to meet the CEO or the founder or the subject matter expert, the, you know, the person that wrote the book, if you will. So if you can pre-arrange appointments for them as opposed to pre-arranging for yourself, you'll have on average about three x, three hundred percent more success pre-arranging meetings and getting people actually show up to your table. Oh my gosh, I don't have the numbers, but we're going to do a study about this because I believe anecdotally that we close exponentially more deals when we've prearranged appointments. Yeah, it's huge. What if someone didn't attend? Oh, so this is my most fu fun thing, crashing a hashtag. <laughs> so if you, if you didn't attend, what I say is crash the hashtag. If, you're, if you know your team is going, but you're not going, and you're gonna have to do the follow-up calls, you simply start following that hashtag on every channel most shows are on twitter but a lot of people are starting to use the hashtags on linkedin and there's a lot of show activity going on on linkedin but also on instagram it just depends on the show and kind of the demographics of the people who go but find out you know facebook um i don't notice as much activity but for certain shows there might be so first of all that's in your research way before the show 
where are they using the hashtag? So find the show hashtag, figure out where it's being used. And if you're not going to the show, but you've got to do the follow-up, then you have to crash the hashtag. Yeah. And so you're going to interact with your own social media profiles with that hashtag. And especially you're going to interact with the companies that you know the people who are at the show want to meet. So I have my clients prepare a watch list and I make them put at least 10 and, but not more than 20 companies that they're dying to meet with. Like these are, maybe they've met with them before, but never really got anywhere or they've never had a chance to meet with them. And they're pretty sure they're going to the show. So we make these watch lists and then we make a Twitter list with those company names. Mm -hmm. And then we use that Twitter list to monitor the posting of those companies so we can figure out if they're going to the show or not. And most of them, if they are going to the show, they're using the hashtag and they're talking about it. And so if you look out for the people that you want to meet and the companies that they're affiliated with on social media and start interacting ahead of time, it's fantastic. I mean, on LinkedIn, you can uh, connect with them and say, hey, I understand your company's going to this show or that you might be going to this show. My team's going to be there. I'll be back home holding down the fort, but I'd love to connect with you. So make a fun human message about the show and about your team that's going and what, you know, you're not going, but you still want to connect. And then you've already got a head start. You, so that's, that's what I say about if you can't attend or you didn't attend, you should, again, way before the show starts, you got to get your plan ready. That, that's a golden tip. The, the crash the hack ta hashtag is brilliant. And everyone, you know, you don't lie, but I, I, I recommend use the royal we. You know, we are going to be at the event. You know, it was great meeting you. It was great for all of us to meet you at the event. Even though you weren't necessarily the person that was there, they don't know. They don't care. That's not the point. The point is that you're actually, like she said before, connecting it and making it human. All right, so how do we approach the list? All right, so if you get a list, which it's really hard to do these days, right? Uh, they sometimes give you the list of companies that are attending with the titles. Occasionally, they give you the names. They rarely will give you any email addresses or phone numbers, right? I mean, it's just, they because think about it. If you gave 100 companies these lists, everybody would be bombarded, unfortunately, with calls and emails that are spammy because people just don't know how to use these lists properly. Um, but again, remember, marketing is one to many. Sales messaging is one to one. Let marketing do their part, right? And let sales do their part. So pre-show, if you get any kind of list at all, plan what marketing is going to send out plan what sales is going to send out, make sure the messages match, including the graphics. Now, I, another little side trip really quick, but I've seen so many mistakes here. People are sending out email messaging and posting on social media with graphics that don't match their booth mm. and they don't match their website. Now, if I'm trying to get you to remember me, but every time you see me, like sometimes my hair is straight and I have uh, round glasses on. The next time you see me, my hair is curly and I don't have any glasses on. And the next time you see me, I have a ton of makeup on and my hair is pulled up in a bun. You're like, is that Alice? I'm not really sure. So if you think about what you're trying to do is be memorable, stand out, be different, have people remember you, remember your conversation so they want to talk to you. So think about the graphics and the messaging you're using. The messaging should match what's relevant at that show. It should match your website or landing page that you're using for the show. And the graphics that you email out and tweet out or post should match so that people see it, see it, see it, see it. Then there they are at the show and they're like, their brain just goes, I recognize that. Yeah. And they come towards you. So it, my little side trip. Sorry it, about that. <laughs> it, no, it's really important, like the, in the connecting on LinkedIn and all that kind of stuff, you know, it, it's, is when you have that split second, you just don't have that much time to get them to go, oh, yeah, connect the dots in their brain and have those synapses fire and connect. Like, that's what makes the difference between making a payoff. Yes. Versus so if you, if, 
Yeah, if you've got the list, do everything you can to make yourself memorable. And absolutely make phone calls before the show. I don't know why people are so afraid to do this. Pick up the phone and, okay, so what if you don't reach them? You'll get their voicemail and leave an amazing message. So excited about this show and the topics that are going to be discussed. I would love the opportunity to meet with you and talk about how your company is doing X. If you'd like to meet up, give me a call. I'm also going to send you an email that makes it easy for you to schedule with me in a happy, upbeat voice. At least you've got a chance. They might, right? So really use that list wisely and use it across all channels. Yep. All right. Now we get to the part that everyone tuned in for. What do we say after the follow-up? So let's listen to some calls and have that commentary there, Alice. All right. Now what we're going to have to do is we got to switch over to yep. audio on my computer my i got a brand new computer if some of you have watched a lot of call camps you can see it doesn't look like uh you know it's it's 1998 anymore here uh so we're <laughs> a lot more sophisticated here at call camp but sam you're ready let me know when you're ready and we're gonna we're gonna switch over so we get no feedback loop you, you mute first you ready all right i hope that worked alice can you hear me okay I can hear you. Yeah, lesson learned. We got to we got to test the mics a little bit further in advance for the webinar next time, but we'll we'll get that one done. All right, so let's go and and have a listen. I've got the audio booster on. But by the way, quick uh, quick hack for everyone: volume booster is just such an awesome uh, awesome place to go. So check out check out the volume booster. And let me uh, we're gonna go and play a couple of calls. First, to listen to here. So, hold on, I put them in the library. We're going to go here to uh, library or site. And we're going to go to call camp. All right, so the first one we're going to listen to is Alex Dixon. He does get the appointment here. We're going to hear how he follows up. Now, one of the things that's kind of worth uh, noting that's pretty interesting here that you're seeing is, is we're not going to play the part of the call that has the IVR in it or the phone ringing. We're going to skip just about past that, but I do want you to hear right at the end of this when he um, when he is able to get in, in some information about the, the direct line. He should be putting that in his in Salesforce. Here we go. Hi. One moment, please. Hello. And Alice, can you hear that okay now? I can. All right, here we go. That is not coming through very clear. It's very difficult to hear mumbled. Oh, no. Is it difficult to hear? Yes. Okay, Sam, plan B. Let's right, go back right. to you. Hold on. Wait till I mute. Sorry. Everyone, hold on. Stand, stand by. Stand, stand by. by. Go back. Give me a second. Okay, I'm good. Can you pull up the Great Lakes call? Okay. So hit it from, so you share your screen now. Do I have to stop mm -hmm. sharing mine? You're doing great. All right, so where were you playing at? Go, go right to the end of the phone ringing. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Technical Perfect. difficulties have been solved. All right, Alice, can you hear us? This is Alex Dixon. Yes, Next much better. I'm good, how are you? I'm doing well. I don't know if you recall, we met and had a really nice conversation last week at the ICMI show at the Exec Vision booth around agent call mm -hmm. coaching, you remember? I do remember, yes. Awesome. You had a uh, safe travel back to Wisconsin? Yes, I did. Excellent. 
wanted to reach out today just to see if we could keep that conversation. All right, pause it, Sam. So, Alice, this is like the quintessential, you know, I, I mean, we could literally like map out, you know, a million follow-up calls and they probably follow, follow this pattern. You right. Know, we met it at this ICMI event, which is a call center event. How were your travels back to Wisconsin? You know, they all sort of follow this pattern. Talk to us. What are you hearing here? Well, I, you know, I think it's just very typical. This is what most people do. And, and in Alex's case, he's lucky the young lady did remember him and she stayed on the line with him. I think that, you know, a couple of things that Alex could do to make it a bit more interesting is just use his voice a bit differently, you know, a little bit more excitement uh, about, oh, you know, something about the show. And uh, besides the travels, he could have, if he had good notes, now, so we don't know what kind of notes Alex had. If he had good notes from one of his teammates, then he could have possibly mentioned something right off the bat besides the travels. Wasn't that speaker fantastic or... Uh, it seemed like the buzz of the trade show was all about X, you know, so we could pick something a bit more exciting and engaging if we have good notes. And again, I don't know what kind of notes Alex had. So the interesting thing here, Alice and guys, this is Sam again. I was at the show and I was part of this conversation. And the really ironic and funny thing is, is these guys actually service my student loans. And I told them that at the show and Alex totally could have referenced that and got uh... I love that. That would have been perfect. So again, though, that is our part of our workflow that has to get planned ahead of time so that Alex remembers and is prompted with whatever he pulled up on the CRM to say, oh, remember, you guys are the ones who, um, you know, serviced Sam's loans. And she would chuckle then, you know. Yeah, it, you got to do that. And then what, what I ideally what would have happened is at the show, I'm guessing this probably did happen. They got into, and everyone, these are some of the keywords you want to look for, you want to listen for on the call. Things like, um, what are their issues? What are their challenges? Uh, what, what are the things they're trying to accomplish for the business? What are their goals? What are their priorities? Yeah. So we could say, yeah, you stopped by. You remember we had that little conversation about how you, you, you uh, do the loan servicing for Sam School Loans? Yeah. You know, you mentioned that consistency is critically important for you. Or you mentioned that you have to now onboard 100 new agents this year. Or you mentioned that you're really concerned about your conversion rates. So, so talking about some of the, the issues pertaining to the business, which in our world we call critical business issues or CBIs, is, is what it's all about. And, that, and that's the thing that I'm kind of challenging. Sam, do a favor, hover over that comment in the middle of the yellow there, kind of, yeah, right there. So I'm, I'm saying like going right for time so I'm using uh, the method that Keenan taught me for coaching called observe, describe, prescribe. I'm observing what Alex is doing, going right for time. And I'm asking Alex a question. I'm prescribing a path forward by saying, what can you do to get her back into the value mindset like she was when she stopped by our table? And what I want to try to do is I want to try to get Alex to conclude for himself, wait a minute, I should probably be talking about the things about her business that she shared with us. So rather than just simply saying, hey, let's schedule some time where you can check out exec vision. Instead, I'm saying, you know, you mentioned that conversion rates are critically important for you. Let's schedule some time for us to walk you through how we can help improve those conversion rates like we did on deck capital, you know, in reference to similar customer and financial services, something like that to tie the pieces together. 100 percent because what again you're you're tying back to what was memorable and it's it triggers something in her brain to go oh yes i wanted to talk to these guys so we've got to have those memorable conversations at the show so that people after the show want to continue that conversation and you're right he could have used some of that to help her remember how much fun they were having talking and, and how, you know, funny it happened to be that, you know, Sam's loan was, you know, part of that. And all, all of those things would have triggered those memories in her brain and made her go, yes, yes, yes. I want to talk to these people versus like, I'm just setting up an appointment, which is a bit mundane, right? So we want to get them re-excited. That's it. That's it. Going and perhaps schedule some time either later this week or, or sometime next week where I could show you a little bit about how exec vision works and learn a little bit more about Great Lakes. You think that'd be possible? 
Um, yeah, maybe sometime next week. You know, like we talked about, too, basically the decisions, they, I wouldn't be the one to make the decision to get new software. Sure. I mean, you can, if you wanted to show me something, and I can take it to our, our managers and our directors. What, we can do that. Would it make more sense for me to just talk to Ms. Keegan? Um, I can see if she would like that. I know she is out this week in Lincoln, and then she's on vacation next week. All right, Sam, pause it there. So, Go over that, hover over that comment there, and the, uh, yeah, would it make more sense to talk to Miss Keenan? So I'm encouraging Alex to put himself in her shoes right now. We're, basically what happened is I guess this woman is saying, hey, look, I'm not the decision maker. I'm just the person that attended the trade show. I am interested, but you know, maybe it's not a good idea to schedule time with me. What can we try to do to get all of the de decision makers or all of the buying influences, the people who are involved, to the table at, at, the, at the same time? You know, what, 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 are, what are the things that he could do differently here, Alice? Any ideas on what he could say differently here rather than should I talk to Ms. Keegan? Well, I would want to make her feel important, right? And again, I would bring back what the conversation was at the show and say, you know, you were so excited about these things and it sounds, you know, I'm making this up now, of course, sounds like you're going to be using this, even though Miss Keegan would be the decision maker. What if we all got on the phone together and share the enthusiasm you have, you know, something like that. So to get her again, wrapped back into it and excited to be part of it and make that introduction and be on the phone so that Alex doesn't have to kind of start from scratch with Miss Keegan. Yep. Yep. I think that's the thing that's that's kind of missing here is like, you know, what value can we add? What offer can we put on the table? I'll give you an example of one that we do in our business. We do a conversation assessment. So this would be a great opportunity to say, you know, look, what I, I know you're getting follow up from like, you know, 100 vendors from this thing and, and they all want to talk to Miss Keegan like we do. Right. What's the thing that we can do? A lot of times they find value and we secret shop their sales line and we assess five or 10 of their conversations and bring the report back to the different stakeholders like the Miss Keegans. It's a great way to do something to provide yes. value, to flip the funnel, if you will, to get everyone to solve a sudden kind of straighten up in their chair, a chair and pay attention and, and really think about how you can solve their problems versus all the other vendors. Right. Very good. All right, so now there's some scheduling. So we'll just play a little bit more here and then we're gonna jump I out of the green reach out to her the following week and see if that's something that she would like to do. Okay. I mean, whichever, uh, I'm just trying to think of what was your team, then, then an introduction mm -hmm. would make sense. And if it's not, then there's no point in introduction, right? Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, do you have a half an hour you can, you can, you can throw on the calendar for, for next week now? Is that, do you have your calendar there? Um, <clears throat> I do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to call, stop right there because I think the rest of this is scheduling, but I would I would recommend to Alex he, he to listen to this and see how he almost talked himself out of having an appointment right at that point. Yeah, that's that, that's right. Like like get that thing on the books and then actually go ahead to the yellow or just before so we can see Alice's highlight before that and then the yellow uh, area. So jump ahead to like maybe like right there. Yeah, and let's just play that one last part at the end, which is not the scheduling part. Beautiful, Sam. Yeah, right there. That's perfect. Nine o'clock, that works. Okay. Well, let's do 9 a.m. Central. I'll send a, a calendar invite. Do you think Kim would be interested? So should I send it to both of you? And, and if she can join, that'd be great. We can just have a, a kind of a group conversation. Um, she's a, <clears throat> she's actually going to be in the office here with me next Wednesday or next week. Oh, so she'll, she'll already be here Wednesday. Oh, that's perfect. So hopefully she can join. Yeah, yep, if you can just send it to me. And Alice, this is the thing that jumped out about this call for me is he did a good job here, pretty good job of trying to get other people involved. In this case, it's Kim. Um, but this yes. is a topic that we refer to or a part of the call we refer to as the button up questions. It's once you schedule the appointment, asking the additional questions. And in fact, we did a call camp on this um, that was called Sam. What was it called again? We just looked it up. Oh, setting meetings that stick. That was in January. Setting meetings that stick. Sam, will, after we're done with this, uh, the deck shall or the the call shall pop it in there. All right. But setting meetings that stick. And one of the things we talk about is at the end of the call, asking besides you, who else sh should be involved? Yes. Who would feel left out? 
because because I have a feeling that Kim and, and Miss Keegan are the tip of the iceberg. There's probably other people as well. And we've got to try to corral more of those people to create a collective learning experience on this next call. We also want to find out this person's cell phone number. And again, goes back to the business issues, right? We still don't know why she's interested. We don't know why. Yes. Did she tell you that, Sam, at the table? Do you remember? So I know the conversation that Alex had with their team, they were able to uncover some of the challenges. I just don't think Alex brought those back up in this conversation. Right. And that's what we're missing is we got, if we're going to, if we're going to, if they're going to tell you their business challenges on the floor of the trade show, they got to get in the CRM and then they've got to be used on the subsequent calls to schedule the next call or, or on the scheduled call. Right. And that all has to be planned out before beforehand so that it works really smoothly. But I'll also say this, that if you really want to close deals because of trade shows, you this is so important that you have to have these critical conversations, remembering this information, getting into the conversation when you call them back and getting all of the other people involved and then get off this call send a follow-up email with a date, time, and place, and a calendar appointment, the agenda, and there's another chance to say. And is there anyone we didn't think of while we were on the call that we should invite? You get another opportunity when you send that follow-up email immediately, getting that appointment firmed up. And again, when you confirm the day before, you can say, uh, I just wanted to check in and make sure that we've got everybody on the call that needs to be. If there's someone you want me to invite at the last minute, let me know. So we have several opportunities, but when we want to advance a sale, in any case, no matter what we're following up from, we've really got to do this great follow-up after these calls and continue to offer opportunities to get others involved that will be interested and that we will need involved before we can close the deal. There it is. We're moving on to Alex's. So, so thanks to Alex Dixon. I think you know Alex Dixon did a very kind of a fine job. I think it's that was a an, an average call. Um, you know, it was it certainly wasn't a poor call. It was an average call. I, I picked this one out because I think this is a more, more representative example of the sorts of things that you can do when you're doing your event follow up. So let's listen to this. And Alice, we're going to get your thoughts. Go ahead. Hey Jennifer, this is Alex over at Exhibition. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing okay. Did you have a quick second? I did. Yeah, definitely. So, does the name uh, Exec Vision ring a bell at all? It does. I'm trying to think <laughs> in my head how. It's like, where is that coming from? Um, yeah. I think you, you you might have spoke with uh, one of my colleagues, Mary Robinson, uh, last year, and okay. uh, Mary Mary has since left the company. She's over at Digital Labs now. But it was, I think it was in August of last year, the summer. And essentially what you folks were talking about was how to get the inside sales team up and running on things like call coaching um, yes. and leveraging best okay. practices. Yep. Is, is that's yep, coming back yep. to you now? <laughs> it is. I met you. Okay, pause right there. So so he was doing the right things, I and I uh, commend him. I would have just made it a little less awkward. My coaching for Alex would be a little less awkward. Don't make her guess who you are. I would have been very um, assertive about, hey, this is Alex from, you met us at, remember we were talking about, so that she could relax a little bit and then and then get into that groove. But he did cover all the things we wanted him to cover in that piece. Yeah, but hold on, Alice, hold that thought because that, that, I mean, template, if you will, that set of talking points, I think if you're listening to this, is something you should write down. Let's go back and revisit that because it's a beautiful little format. Hi, this, say that piece one more time, please. Oh, <laughs> hi, this is Alex. We met at, and we were discussing, um, you know, and I'm, you know, and I'm following up with you, something like that. Exactly. Now that, that template, the set of talking points he does follow alice's points exactly right he should have done it earlier to set the context sooner and that's the key word in all this is context like yeah you no know, it's 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 a long time after that event you know get getting the phone call you got to get back in that context otherwise it means nothing so sam let's play from here and you're going to hear that she actually remembers wait a minute she met me it turns out at the outreach conference <laughs> yeah that's right a little conversation about she thought yeah, it was time. at an outreach conference and I met. It might, it might have been Ted Martin or Steve Richard, or the VP of Sales and our CRO. Steve Richard. I met Steve. I have his card right in front of me. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, he yeah, uh, is. Okay, wearing... pause there for a second because this is so important. Steve obviously had a memorable conversation with her or that card would not be in front of her. And so again, anyone who's trained properly to work the booth at the trade show can learn to have a memorable conversation versus pitch them or you know talk about something that doesn't matter. I, this person remembered Steve clearly and that is what we want. Beautiful example. Very good. We're gonna play one more minute rap. Steve, oh, oh my gosh, no. I hope no. not. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> was, uh, I'm trying to remember his look, but yeah, I do remember. For sure. He's, he's yeah, he, he, his look, I would describe it as mundane, uh, but his attitude is uh, usually <laughs> very, very positive, and he's usually the bell of the ball at some of those events because he, he talks a lot. Yeah. Um, if I remember <laughs> right, I remember him to be that way. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, part of the reason why I was reaching out to you, or rather, the main reason was actually to find a time after quarter end uh, for us all to, to reconnect. Maybe if you had some time that, that first week of July. Yeah, so we're doing some shifting around. Um, we are reorging a little bit. And, uh, and, we and now, this is the net. Because he has the topic. He had mentioned the topic earlier in the call, but he should have done it earlier, as Alice mentioned. And because of the connection point at the event, but what he should have done is say, you and Steve at the outreach event talked about X, Y, or Z, and he had that too. Alex knows this, right? I know he has this in his pre-call research field in Salesforce. It was, it was there. He just didn't say it. But because of that, now she's sharing information about a reorg that's going on, some business challenges that are going on. And now there, she's much more willing to engage in that conversation and to open up and share information about the, what's going on in the business and why it could be a good time or not a good time for us to talk. So Alice, what are some other, any other kind of final thoughts in this call before we wrap? Well, I thought he did a great job. I, I did get to listen to uh, the whole call. And I think that he established rapport really well with her. Um, it was a little choppy at the beginning. So I think that awkwardness of her having to just remember, oh yeah, exec vision. Like we said, if he if he would get to that point quicker, you know, we're from exec vision and this is where we met and you might've met Steve Richards and or whoever the other person was. Um, and then he got straight to what her concerns were, which was wonderful. And they got into a really good conversation about the needs. So even though he was still strong, he was, his purpose of his call was to schedule a conversation with all of the right people. He got her remembering all of the things that were important to her that she had discussed with you, Steve, at that conference. And again, that memorability, it's in the brain, it's sparking her memory and making her think, oh yeah, this is what we need. And because, you know, we need so many people at a trade show and we're so excited when we're there and then we're so exhausted when we get home and all that excitement fades away. So we've got to uh, trigger their memory to go back to that good feeling they were having when they were talking to us at the booth and remembering uh, that we had a good conversation so that they want to continue it. That is what it's all about. Preparation we've covered. We've covered the post-event workflow. We've covered the importance of good notes. We, we gave you a lot of tactics for stuff that you can do that's you know, sort of secret things that no one ever talks about, like asking for cell phone numbers and, you know, setting appointments with the CEO pr prior to the event. I call them kind of trade show hacks or event hack. We talked about the connection point with marketing and, and how important it is to have everything be aligned with marketing along the way and not be a grocery store clerk scanners to ultimately do right. great opportunities. So tell us a little bit about, about your business, about trade show makeover. Well, our mission at Trade Show Makeover is to make sure companies like the ones that are listening don't leave money on the trade show floor. We want to help them get the deals that everyone else is leaving behind because most companies are showing up, scanning badges, and then sending out emails afterwards. And these interested parties are not necessarily turning into sales opportunities that get into your pipeline. So we want to make sure that the sales team and everyone that works the booth with the sales team has all the training they need to turn the leads into deals. 
That's it. And uh, I, you know, if you think about the total economic impact of trade shows, it's probably substantial for the amount of money that's being left on the table. You know, may, who knows? Maybe there's even like a, a tenth of a percentage point in economic growth that we're all collectively leaving on the table. Because yes, I'll tell you what, if you ever if you ever go to a trade show and you're sitting around looking at your smartphone, and if you have a you know you're you're a platinum sponsor and you've got couches set up and you're hanging out with your legs crossed or looking at your laptop, look, you can look at that stuff whenever you want. It's very, very rare in our profession to literally be in a room surrounded by our best buyers, the top. Right. Buyers. Like, go and talk to them about them and their business and the things that are challenging and why they're there. Go and engage in a conversation. Is it a little bit awkward? Hell yeah. You know what's also awkward? Missing your number and getting fired. That sucks too. So just suck it up. Go out there and do it. Everyone always asks me, like, wow, why are you such a super network guy? I'm like, because I had to be because I founded a company and I wanted to stay in business and I like feeding my four children. It's just as simple. And guess what? Some of the best friends and relationships I've ever made were on trade show floors. And I can tell you it's because I wasn't pitching them. They didn't become my friend because I was pitching them. They became my friend because I actually cared about them. I cared about their organization and I tried to help them along the way. Sometimes that was me. Sometimes that was making an introduction, but you became a part of the community, just like you did, Alice. When you came over, <laughs> I mean, now we knew each other, but when you came over to me in Chicago and said, would you be up for us taking a look at your booth? And I said, sure. And I, yeah, darn it, that's why we're here today. If you didn't do that, we probably wouldn't be talking. Yeah. So the, I think the key really here is we've covered so many great things. Just know that there are ways that you can improve the results you get from trade shows. And just start simple. Start with better planning. You know, start simple and do some of the things we talked about and then that will help your team be able to follow up better and actually turn leads into deals very good all right everyone uh what do we have for next month on call camp sam to be decided stay tuned oh we've got a to be determined okay so if you if you have something that you want uh you can chat it in right now you can use that hashtag for call camp let us know if you've got a topic that you're looking for you know i've heard people talk about gatekeepers maybe it's time for us to re-up on that uh, you know, maybe it's time for us to, to re-up on, for example, um, you know, how to handle inbound web leads, something like that. So we'll figure it out. All right, everyone. Thanks so much.